What do you say to those who can't, who argue that the UK can't fix climate change on its own because of bigger emitters like China? Uh, so why try? Why should we do do these things? Well, that is a, a, a very dismal uh, and um, pessimistic view of life. Agree. Uh, to, <laughs> to go through and say, oh, well, we're not we're not going to bother when you can actually when you you've done the arguments, mm -hmm. you've explained the argument that it is absolutely essential that it should be done. Essential, if we are going to avoid uh, massive social un unrest, apart from anything else, massive destructions of all sorts of systems. And we say, oh, well, yes, uh, it's going to happen, so we won't go wash our hands with we, we it. We have the nations of the world in, in COP, in COP21, have mapped out in detail a practical way of dealing with this. And thank goodness have, have, cover, have carried the rest of the nations, of the, the, all the contributors, agreed to do it. It's, it's going to be difficult. But to say it's difficult, therefore we won't try, is, is, is simply not acceptable. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mark Borsa. Um, so David, I want to follow on the points that Vernon Coker made, really, which is the uh, impact on our prosperity of the changes that um, you're arguing we should make. Um, we're the business committee as well as being the energy committee, and so we're very interested in the, the uh, competitiveness and the ability of British industry and British ma manufacturers to create the jobs and the prosperity that this country needs. Do you think that... Uh, we've got uh, contradictory objectives here. If we want to increase prosperity at the same time as deal with the issue affecting our climate. There are also huge opportunities of development, huge opportunities of getting things right and benefiting as a consequence. And uh, I have been speaking recently with various, um, in Gestalt, for example, and, and with the international financial bodies um, and uh, it's clear to them that actually this is an opportunity to get things right this is an opportunity to make big profits this is an opportunity in which to innovate new systems and if we're ahead of the game we will benefit as a consequence well, uh, but, and do people understand the, the lifestyle changes that they need to make let's take um, air travel for example uh, I mean aerospace is a big and important industry in the UK, we're expanding our airports. Do you think people are willing and ready to reduce the number of flights they make, for example, in order to achieve the changes uh, that we're arguing for? Well, they won't. They won't. I don't, can't believe they will just be happy to say, "Oh, it's I don't care. I, I'm, I'm just going ahead." And there is a way, of course, in which those in power, as it is, influence how many people take it, and that's in, that's economically. I mean, you, you adjust the price to to the various restrictions that you have. So you would argue that air travel should become more expensive, Sir David? I, th I think that um, one way of reducing these things is to count the cost of what it, what it is that, that, the, that, that um, the air travel costs in real terms, in terms of the environment. And if you cost that, you would see that the tickets are extraordinarily cheap. And should we reduce people's expectation of being able to make a couple of flights every year to, to Spain or France or on holiday? Do you, do you think well, we should restrict that in some way? I don't know how you would restrict it other than, other than economically. And is that not going to affect those who are less able to pay? Is there yes. an equality issue here? Are you, are you, are you happy I'm with that? I'm afraid that is, afraid that is the case. And are people guilty of tokenism? I mean, we're talking, for example, people will make an effort to use less plastic, but is that really going to have a significant impact on changing our climate? Are people just going to, or maybe say, well, I'll take one less overseas holiday than I might have. Do people really understand the changes that they're, they're, they will have to make in their lifestyle? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I don't know how else you would actually transfer it into practical business, into practical life, uh, except by putting that. I mean, you put the economic uh, factor uh, into it. Of course, uh, it would be nice to think that that we were also putting the 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 uh, theoretical argument which you've outlined, which is that we shouldn't be all travelling. I mean, I certainly worry that the job I do involves me travelling 
I have travelled by air uh, only too frequently in the last six months alone in order to make programmes. Um, some of them programmes about the very subject that we're talking about, which is, I dare say, a paradox. Um, but, uh, but certainly we're going to have to, of course, the, the, the long-term solution is that you, you work out a, a, a way of powering aeroplanes mm -hmm. electrically. And that's already, that's already practical, practical, practical. And if you can actually translate that so that we, and, uh, air transport becomes non-polluting, then that's the way out and we're back in a you know, tolerable circumstance. Okay, and if people do have to change their lifestyles and it, you know, it involves them being perhaps slightly less well off, perhaps enjoying their li life slightly less because they're able, not able to travel as much, do you think there's a backlash? I mean, you changed, you spoke very convincingly about the change in attitude of young people. Do you think, there, I mean, as politicians, we're, we are rewarded for economic growth, for yes. helping people be better yes. off, and you're arguing that we should be looking to restrict that in some way. Is there, is there yeah, a danger I'm, of a... I'm arguing that, that, that in, unless we do restrict it to some degree, they're going to have a much bigger and more serious collapse. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Albert Owen. Thank you, Oh, sorry, Stephen Kerr, do you want to comment? I want to follow up there to David on what Mark Bosey said, because one of the concerns I've got is that there's such a low level of engagement at a practical level in terms of what lifestyle changes will be asked of people, that when there is a dawning realisation of what these changes might mean in terms of lifestyle, that there will be a negative reaction. Does that concern you? And what message would you give to government in terms of engaging with people at the practical level of what lifestyle changes are necessary? Well, certainly. Uh, and, and so what you're really uh, opening, the, um, the problem you're, you're opening now is, is a very serious one. Uh, we are, we are, if, we, if the world climate change goes on as it is, we are going to be facing huge problems with immigration. Uh, Af large parts of Africa will become even less inhabitable than they are now. Um, and we, there's going to be major um, upsets in the balance between our uh, national boundaries. Uh, and what President Trump is doing about Mexico, and indeed what the rest of Europe is doing about in, in, in people coming from Africa now, are those kind of problems are going to grow inexorably. And we're going to have to decide what we're going to do about it. And I don't pretend I know the answer to that. But uh, um, I don't, um, that's, that's for the future. But that's going to happen. Mm. But you, you think that governments should engage with people more widely to illustrate what these lifestyle changes that will be necessary on our part in relation to these I, changes. I, I think that, that, that uh, an awareness of what the problems are are inevitably a part of the arguments that are about restricting temperature rise. Yeah, yeah. And I think the more micro level these lifestyle changes are as things stand, the more the public will embrace them. Let us hope. I mean, uh, one can only hope that, 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 that the answer to problems is understanding and not yeah. ignorance. Yeah, yeah. Um. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, David, you said recently at Davos, and I quote uh, selectively here, we can create a world of clean air and water, unlimited energy and fish stocks that we can sustain us well into the future, but we need a plan. What is that plan? What would you like to see governments collectively across the globe do immediately to uh, address the problem? Um, I, I don't suppose I could possibly outline a plan in that sort of way. What, I'm, what I suppose I was thinking about, talking about that, is that we should, we should expose what these problems are, we could expose what we think solutions of them are, and think about the consequences. I don't see we can do better than that. Okay, so what kind of life do you think our grandchildren are going to, to lead? You mentioned earlier this is not a problem for us that are in this room but for future generations. I mean, and can uh, humanity address the impact of climate change in time so they have a, a decent life? Um, I suppose you have to define what you think by a decent life and sure. that must be bound up with in fact what your ambitions are as a human being. Um, and, uh, and that's a question of 
of individual moralities as to how you accept uh, inequalities between human beings. But you also mentioned that some of the larger countries in the world are not sort of pulling their weight at this moment in time. And you, you refer to the United States, that it's uh, legal obligations of COP uh, agreements, etc. China is quite optimistic about the future. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Institute said there was no way we could reduce, uh, sorry, that the temperatures wouldn't be reduced by 1.5. He's now saying it, it can be done. So what do countries of the world need to be doing now so that future generations can look to us and say they're making a good job of it so that for our future? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, the, que the question is, you said that there should be a plan, right? You're not sure what the plan should be. So let, let me ask you, uh, the first question to you was, what had you seen in your long life of reporting that was stark, that you saw there was climate change? What do you think we should do now that can reverse that? What, what should be done? I, th I think it, it is fair to ask you a, a, a question so that you can help us yeah. in our deliberations as we move forward. I think we should be doing, um, we should be investing, uh, encouraging industry to invest in new techniques to deal with um, the generation of power. One of the, the paradoxes is that the, the power is streaming down upon the earth and the sun with no restriction on it at all. Um, and uh, we can draw it directly with no problems, except we, sh and, and to, to properly take advantage of that, we have to make sure that we have got ways in which we can store power batteries which we can store power on a major scale and ways in which we can transport power um, without a, a major loss uh, in, 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 uh, of the product as it were. So the, it would be possible if we can solve those problems we can change the, the, the polluting problems of both airlines and motor cars. Now we're on the way to that. The, the, the scientific knowledge known uh, already there as to how to deal with the batteries and so on is, is also there and if we can only coordinate the methods in which the practical methods in which we can bring about storage and transport of, of energy we have got a huge solution to a majority or to a great number of our problems. Do you think we're making progress? Hmm? you think we're making good progress? Well, I, I think we probably are, um, and I, I don't know, there are all sorts of, of suggestions that come through my post, or maybe yours too, of people who think that they know a solution in which way they could do one, each one of those problems. I have, I've met quite a lot of people who are um, absolutely certain that they know how they could actually store energy, for example. Now, I'm not a... I'm not a physicist, I'm not an industrialist, and I'm not an economist. Um, but the, and so I don't know what stands in their way. I don't know where, they, where the hitches are. But there are people who, who understand that, and I just hope they're getting on with it. Finally, we, in an earlier exchange, talked about CFCs in the 1980s, and there was a solution to that. Do you think the world now understands climate change and we can find a solution? I want to finish my question on a line of optimism. I don't know about the world. Uh, uh, generalizations of that scale is beyond me, I'm afraid. Um, I, even I don't really understand our society. How do I know what people in the, the height and the uh, all corners of this British society are thinking? I don't know. Um, and I suspect <coughs> none of us do. But all we can do on is, is, is talking about what we think are the sensible solutions to the problems that we also ought to recognize. Young people, and there's many sitting behind you here, uh, yeah. have yeah. you know have given us hope as well. Absolutely, I mean, some, some of these protests, the school strikes, etc., yes. has given the us ideal, hope. The idealism of, of, of youth is something that should be treasured and, and respected, and and uh, let us hope they maintain it into their adult life. Thank you, Stephen Cohen, then Vernon Coker. Just building on what Albert was saying, I think what we're really trying to ascertain from you is, are you optimistic that we're going to be able to crack this problem of climate change? Do you know, I, I have no idea uh, what, what the future holds. Okay. Um, I, I see no future in being pessimistic because that leads you to say, then 
to hold it. Mm. Why should I care? And I believe that way disaster lies. So I, I feel an, ob ob an obligation. It's the only way you can get up in the morning if, if, is to believe that actually we can do something about it. And I, I suppose I think we can. Whether that is optimistic or not, I don't know. And whether, in fact, it's going to produce a result or not, I don't know. But that's the only way I can operate, that I have to get up in the morning and say, something has got to be done, and I will do my best to bring that about. Thank you. Vernon Coker? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to finish on this, uh, uh, or, uh, this optimism, unless there are one or two other questions, I'm not sure. But um, Peter Carl and I were just talking um, <coughs> Uh, uh, about the fact, Sir David, that to our committee, you've drawn the youngest audience that, <laughs> that we've ever had. And the serious point to it is, is the fact that you, uh, as uh, somebody who's worked for decades in this area, the optimism must be that you've inspired a young generation. I mean, they're, they're, they're impacting behind you. And that was the point with the questions that I've asked and others have asked about we have to be optimistic but challenge ourselves, it seems, uh, to do better. But you look at all these young people here, demanding that... Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure they've come for us as well, but... That's <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it is their world yeah. that we are playing. It is their futures that are in our hands. And if these places that I'm here... There, don't inspire you to do that. I don't know what will. 